Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. If I may have your attention, good morning. Ed Jurechin, the director of the Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy, and I'm delighted to welcome you all uh, for this inaugural conference of our presidential elections program. Throughout the year, the Baker Institute is celebrating its 25th anniversary, it's hard to believe, 25 years, with a series of commemorative events and a gala in November. Today's program is an important one of these commemorative events. The logo for our year is a quarter century making history. This theme represents what we've built, an internationally recognized think tank and a premier forum for the discussion and debate of public policy, which we'll be doing today. The idea to create the presidential elections program came from our honorary chair, Secretary Baker, who having managed five presidential campaigns, knows something about the issue. And he thought it important to develop a nonpartisan resource to study presidential elections, especially given the experience of 2016. So this program, which in the future will be held in years before and after an election, aims to shed light on evolving trends in presidential elections. So I think that regardless of one's political affiliation, we all can agree that elections and politics seem to be changing in ways not yet fully understood. This program is a prime example of our Institute's continuing evolution in addressing our na nation's major problems, everything from healthcare, energy policy, drug policy, Middle East, foreign policy, et cetera. In addition, the Baker Institute in Houston, Texas, is situated in a key state for presidential primary campaigns and critical fundraising efforts for any candidate. So drawing on the resources of the Institute, Rice University, and across the country, this program will be a valuable asset to the national study of American politics. So without further ado, allow me to welcome to the stage John Williams, Secretary Baker's policy assistant at the Baker Institute Fellow, working on this program, who will introduce our first panel on the role of social media in the 2016 election. John. Good morning, thank you so much for being here. Uh, a reminder that at the end of each session we're going to have some Q&A on the table, there are cards. If you have questions, fill them out. Some of the Baker uh, Institute staffers will come around and pick them up and we'll get a, 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 model, a dialogue going towards the end. Uh, today's panel is moderated by Joe Barnes, who started working for Secretary Baker back in 1990 as an advance man for the secretary for his plane and then as, later as a speechwriter. He moved to Houston and did some of the legwork after Secretary Baker left office and helped with the creation of the Baker Institute, where today is the Bonner Means Baker Fellow. The panelists are Zach Moffat, Digital Director for Mitt Romney's 2012 presidential campaign, who has also served as Deputy Director for statewide efforts at Freedom's Watch. Today, Mr. Moffat is founder and CEO of Targeted Victory. Juliet Turner-Jones. A sophomore at Rice University studying, among other subjects, and I love this one, the law and, so, uh, and social thought. She has written three books about American governance and is National Youth Director of a nonprofit organization that stresses the importance of the U.S. Constitution. Katie Harboth, Facebook's Global Director of Policy Programs in charge of politics and government outreach. Previously, she had been chief digital strategist at the National Republican Senatorial Committee and led digital strategy for Rudy Giuliani's presidential campaign. Mark Jones, co-director of the Presidential Elections Program and a political science fellow at the Baker Institute. Mark, as you know, is a, is a go-to expert for journalists wanting to know all about Houston and statewide politics. Thank you. Good day, I'm Joe Barnes. I'm gonna be the panelist, uh, I mean the moderator on this panel. I, uh, it's gonna be a good one, an interesting one. The whole subject of uh, social media and digital advertising in general, of course, is, a, is an important and frankly controversial subject. 
Uh, the format we're going to use, uh, we'll ask the, uh, uh, the various panelists to, to make presentations, uh, hopefully not to exceed uh, maybe 11, 12 minutes. Uh, if I come and tap you on the shoulder, you know why. Uh, the reason we're limiting these presentations is because we hope, to, hope to have a decent period of time uh, for questions and answers at the end. Uh, so let's begin, without further ado, uh, with uh, Ms. Harbath of uh, Facebook. This looks like a clicker. Hi, good morning. My name's Katie Harbath. Um, as I mentioned, I run our global politics and government outreach team at Facebook. And so what that means is I have a team of folks around the globe that work with politicians, political parties, elected officials, governments, on how to best use Facebook. And we also help to manage all of Facebook's election strategy. And so, as you can imagine, my life's been pretty busy um, lately. Um, I, I am going to, what I wanted to talk about today was talk about some of the ways that we are taking some of the lessons and things that we learned from what happened on our platform in 2016, things that shouldn't have, and what we're doing to improve those. There's a lot. Um, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, so I really look forward to answering your questions, and I'm always happy to answer any follow-up ones afterwards. I'm not too hard to find on various social media platforms. To start, so there's five main things that we're doing. And when you think about some of the issues that came out of 2016, sometimes all of them get, get conflated together. And there's a lot of related but separate ones. There's the issue of false news and you know Macedonian teenagers running websites trying to, to make money. There's the issue of foreign interference. There's the questions around political advertising and micro-targeting and who, what are candidates saying to voters and who are they saying it to. And then they're just overall trying to improve civic engagement. And so five things that, if, if I had to boil it all down to what we're doing into five things, we are combating foreign interference, and I'll go into that more. We are doing a lot of work on trying to reduce the number of fake accounts on Facebook. We find the more, we're pretty good at, at fighting the automated ones um, that people try to make, but what's harder is when it's actual humans creating these accounts that are not about, that are not themselves, they're misrepresenting who they are, and trying to make them seem like real people. We're doing a lot more around ads transparency and transparency around political ads, a lot of work around false news, and then a lot of work around civic engagement. So, and sorry for the formatting on the, uh, on the slides. Um, when, I've been at Facebook now for seven years, and the team has grown a lot since then. We started building out a product team in 2015, and over those years, we've developed a set of principles to help guide us in this work. The first is to serve people's interests first, not Facebook's. I have never once, by company leadership, been asked to do any of this work to make more money for the company. It has always been indirect to our mission of helping to connect everyone around the world, and that includes connecting people to their elected representatives and those that want to represent them. We want to make sure we keep people safe. There's places in this world that if people share opposing political opinion, that can put them in some real life danger. And we want to make sure that the things that we build don't inadvertently do that and put people in harm's way. We want to be fair. We want to provide the same opportunities to everyone. Whether you're running for president, you're running for city council, you have the same tools and opportunities on our platform. We want to be representative. We want to make sure products that we build work for people, no matter how they're using Facebook or what sort of data connection they have. You look at a place like India, where some people have smartphones and they have strong enough data to watch video, et cetera. Other places are in more rural areas, where they may not even have cell coverage and they have to go to their local village to connect to the Wi-Fi. We want to be constructive. We want to do what our part of what we can do to help build empathy and try to diffuse polarization. That's an issue that isn't just happening on Facebook, but we're looking at what can we do to try to help with those issues. And then we want to know our impact. We want to know is what we're doing helping or, or harming. And we want to know that so that we can keep improving and we can keep getting better. So elections integrity is one part of our work, just to give you a sense of how we sort of structure this at Facebook. Um, myself and my colleague, Samir Chakrabarty, who's on the product side, we look at elections from a global scale. We help to set the strategy, we help to set the prioritization um, of where our teams are going to work. We look at how we can try to solve problems across regions. 
But then for each country that's having elections, we start about a year and a half to two years out. Um, because we know that what worked in one, like what worked in the US, we cannot just port over to Brazil. We can't just port it over to India. We can't just port that over to Germany. And so we work and we do a lot of research on the ground. We talk to civil society groups, we talk to academics to get a sense of what the issues are in that country, how they like to engage civically to make sure that what we are doing um, is something that is going to work for their country. And then for elections integrity, there's a lot of teams at Facebook and product teams that are working on some of these issues that are happening regardless if there's an election, like false news, but they're amplified during election times. And so Samid works across, and myself, work across product teams to make sure they know which elections are coming up. So they understand that the product decisions that they're making, what implications they could have um, if they're rolled out in a country during an election period. So how do we think about the problem? When we think about foreign interference, and actually we need to dig down a little bit deeper, and we need to look at what are the different areas that they're trying to exploit on the platform that we need to protect. And it really falls into three buckets. We want to make sure people have the right information about the election. We want to make sure they feel safe expressing their, their viewpoints. And we want to make sure they're motivated to turn out and to participate. And so we're looking at um, what we can do around combating misinformation. Uh, and that can be around false news, and I'll talk about how we combat that a little bit. Um, but also people trying to share wrong information about the election date or how they can vote. We want to look at what we can do around people trying to falsely amplify um, a viewpoint online by coordinating with a large group of people, trying to make something seem more popular online than what it might actually be. We want to do what we can around people trying to do misrepresentation. That could be anything from people trying to create pages in the name of a candidate and pretending that the candidate's saying something, or pretending to be a news organization, such as you know they could have a web URL that's NewYorkTimes.com, but just two letters are transposed, and so it looks, if at first glance, it looks like the legitimate New York Times, but it's not, and it's trying to spread false news. On the safety side, we want to do what can we do around uh, protecting people from being bullied for their political views. What we can do to make sure Facebook isn't used to instigate violence. That's something we worked on a lot for the Kenyan election last year. That was something we were very worried about. Um, we do a lot around account security. So a lot of working with candidates and political parties around making sure simple things of making sure you have a strong password on your account and that you're using our two-factor authentication to try to prevent people trying to hack into your accounts. And then on turnout, we try to do what we can around just um, people, again, sharing that information around, like, oh, you can just text this number to vote. Or, you know, Republicans vote Tuesday, Democrats vote Wednesday. Those types of things that we want to make sure that aren't happening on our platform. So again, when we think about combating foreign interference, we've got to look at all these vectors that they might be trying to exploit. So a couple of the other things that we're doing, ads transparency. So we're doing four things around political ads on Facebook that are going to be rolling out here in the next couple of months. The first, and this we're testing in Canada right now, but you're going to be able to go to any page on Facebook and see the ads that they're currently running. Um, this will just be the creative, but th we're doing this because we believe that all ads should be transparent and also making the determination of what is an issue ad or what is a political ad or that could have impact on an election is actually not a really easy thing to do. Um, and so we just wanted to provide transparency around all advertising happening on the platform. And then specifically in the US, we're going to be labeling political ads. And so, and we're also going to be go, uh, making people go through an authorizations process. So if you want to run a political ad on Facebook, you're going to have to show us your ID to prove to us you are who you are. You're going to have to prove to us that you live in the United States. Um, by We're going to send you a postcard to your house, and you're going to have to then go back to your account and put in that code. And then after that, when you run an ad, you're going to be able to add this political label, and then you'll see at the top it has the, a shorter disclaimer, so like paid for by Katie Harbeth for Congress. The middle screenshot shows you we will prompt people so that they know that they can click on that, which will then um, bring up a pop-up on the bottom where there will be more information about that candidate um, and the longer, the longer disclaimer. In addition to this, any of these ads that have, are, are, have this political label are going to go into a four-year archive. So any ads that start running here in 2018 are going to be available till 2022. Um, you're going to be able to see for those ads the demographics of who saw them, so age, gender, location. You're going to be able to see a range of how much they spent on those ads and how many people and the impressions 
that they had. And this is going to be a searchable archive, so you're going to be able to search by candidate and see what ads that candidate is running, but also what any super PACs or other organizations, what other ads that they are running about those candidates. And so these are going to be launched here very soon. What the work we're doing on false news. So a lot of people have heard about, may, may have heard about some of the work we do with our fact checkers, but there's a couple of things we're trying to do to combat false news. I mentioned our work around fake accounts. Again, that's one of the most important things that we can do. Then we try to do work around just reducing the spread and the reach of problematic content. And so we, if, you are, if you are a link that's just going to a website that just has a bunch of ads on it, um, we're going to downrank that content. Um, we're trying to reduce the economic incentives of trying to share this content. We also reduce the reach of URLs that have headlines that are, we consider clickbait. So ones that are like, you know, woman jumps in pool, you won't believe what happens next those types of headlines. And then we also work with our fact checkers. Um, so we work with um, Pointer Institute has a um, fact checking program and we work with those partners around the globe uh, to um, help us to, if they see URLs on the site that they've um, done research on and they determine that it's false, um, we reduce the reach of those URLs. If people see them on Facebook, they see a unit underneath where it has the fact checker story and it has a label that says it's been fact checked. Um, and, uh, and then people also get a notification if they shared that content. So if they share that content and then later on a fact checker marks it as false, they will get a notification that they had shared something that a fact checker had deemed false. We also are trying to do a lot of work on improving just um, overall digital literacy with folks and being more critical consumers of news. So we worked with the museum to develop 10 tips for people of how to spot false news and we run PSAs, public service announcements, both on Facebook and off Facebook and print ads and et cetera, um, for helping people to, uh, to see those tips. And then finally, we do a lot of work on civic engagement too. We have found, and I'll share some examples here, um, that we can do a lot in terms of helping people to better um, be a part of this process. So I was talking a lot about election integrity and civic integrity. We do a lot of work around elections products and then also around governance tools. So when we think about elections, there's obviously a large, you know, a journey that people go through and we build products for every single part of this. From helping people to know when their election is, to register to vote, ahead of the Texas primary here, we were showing people a notification on their newsfeed and Facebook to remind them that the deadline was approaching. We show people um, everything that's gonna be on their ballot. We help them to make a decision, to compare and contrast the positions of the different candidates or political parties. On election day, we show them election day reminders that it's election day and how, where they can go and vote. And then after the election, we share with them who their newly elected representatives are and how they can find them on Facebook. So some of this work in 2016, we estimate we, help, we helped uh, register over 2 million people um, through our voter registration products, both during the primaries and during the general election. We also found that with our ballot information that we helped increase voter knowledge by about 6% by showing people who was on their ballot. Because many people know, you know, if they know who's running for president, they might know who's running for governor or senate, maybe they're a member of Congress, but when you start to get down to the local level, many people don't even know until they get into the ballot box um, of who's running, and so we wanted to increase that information. I mentioned the unit of helping people to compare and contrast where the parties stand. Um, that's that unit there on the, on the right. Um, that appeared, if anybody clicked on an article about the election in their newsfeed, they were then shown this unit and encouraging them to go compare and contrast the positions of the parties or the candidates. And those are positions that the parties and candidates inputted into, onto their Facebook pages themselves. And then on governance, we have a product here um, in the states called Town Hall. You can go to Facebook and see all your elected representatives and if they are on Facebook. And when we launched this last year, we made a million new connections in the first month from that product. So finally, um, there's a lot of different elections that are happening this year. We're tracking about 40 of them just in 2018 alone. We learn from every election. We are, we are just beginning in terms of um, our election integrity products, what we can be doing to combat this. There's never going to be a point in time where we're going to say we're done. Bad actors always are going to try to find new ways to exploit our systems and we're going to have to constantly make sure that they can't do what they did in the past but that we're looking forward and making sure that they can't keep doing it and what are the new tactics that they're trying to use. And so we are trying to learn from every single one of these international elections as we build up not just to our midterms but also thinking about 2019 and 2020. So with that, thank you so much.
So, um, thank you very much for having me. I, I want to talk a little bit about it. I think it's very easy to think about social media from the standpoint of what apps are on your phone, what's Snapchat, what's Twitter, what's Facebook, and I think we're going to get into that definitely on the questions. But what I like to do is take a step back and think about it. What did 2016 show us? What it really showed us was political campaign is broken. The way people were campaigning, there were different types of people running different campaigns throughout. And there was an antiquated model. Like some campaigns had huge super PACs, very broadcast heavy. They were very kind of like slow and un unable to be nimble to keep up. You know, and, and really they kind of reflected the way that campaigns were run a decade before. On the flip side, you have the Trump campaign that was very flat and was iterative. And we'll kind of talk through what that means and how they were able to harness the power of social media to kind of force multiply that and get earned media picked it up and push it far and wide, you almost think of Twitter as like the tip of the communication spear. They were able to get messages out and then rely on traditional media to get it far and wide, but it was just a very, very different approach. But the reality is on campaigns, what we really are is we're in a constant war for attention. You know, on the average person has 27 apps on their phone, but five apps constitute about 79% of the time you spend in a month. Facebook, for example, is one in five minutes on mobile. So when you're on your device, 20% of the time, you're in your Facebook app. That's really like the big differential that allows it um, to make a huge difference. So what did Trump prove through the election? Well, one thing he did better than almost anyone else was always an arming allies. No matter what he was saying, he was always pushing out, whether it was on social media, whether it was people on their, on their cable news, they always knew what he wanted, to, where he was going. And even when he pivoted, they kind of pivoted with him in real time, which is a very, very different approach. He also showed that speed kills. The amount of times that he would attack a candidate, and 12 hours later, they would come back with what they thought was the perfect response, and he'd already moved on. He was three moves past them. And it was really hard for campaigns because they didn't know how to respond in real time to all the things he was throwing at them. And you could see it was actually causing to kind of spin out, they weren't able to get from point A to point B because they were grappling with themselves so much. He also showed that the difference is that, you know, in DC, there's a lot of thoughts on like, we need the perfect ad. This is the silver bullet. This is the headshot. If we do this, this will take this candidate out. And what Trump proved is no, it's the everyday jabs. And you look up one day and you completely wore down the other side's defenses. Every single day they were on offense and they used social media in order to do that, which has changed the way that people were covering it. And then the final thing, which is obviously a challenge, there's not a commentary on it, but the concept of fake news is real. 46% of Americans now, per Axios in, in October, believe that the media is making up stories about Trump. That doesn't mean that it's true. It means that there's an entire subsection of people who believe this is true. Within Republicans, some it's 76%, they think news stories are being made up by Trump, which by muddying the water makes it very hard to keep up with all the pieces that are going. So when you couple that with how quickly the news flow is moving, it makes it very hard, and social media is really exacerbating that throughout the process. So the question for people is, knowing that, are you structured for success? Most people aren't even staffed in a way to keep up with the demands for the new information flow. They cannot get things approved quickly enough. They don't know if they can get legal sign off. They don't know what the communications process is. They really don't know what role people play. How do you make it suddenly bilingual? What happens is campaigns almost get paralysis because they're not structured for the way the information is flowing this day. You don't get the luxury now of getting a phone call from a reporter and saying, hey, it's 11 a.m. By 4 p.m. if you get back to me, that's totally fine. What they say is, I'm going to be live, I'm going to be out in 10 minutes, you got to move and you got to be able to go. Sometimes because they know someone else is about to move with it. And so campaigns have to rethink how they approach social media for this. And we haven't reorganized our institutions to take advantage of this. So we don't have teams who just think hour to hour. We don't have people who look a week ahead. We don't have people who look a month ahead. And so sometimes campaigns almost resemble five-year-olds playing soccer, where they run wherever the ball is, because that's the only way that they know how. And as a result, they lose fact of that they're trying to actually win an election, which has become a huge problem. And are you able to move at the speed of politics? This is a thing, I mean, even big brands are seeing this now. I'm sure people look at campaigns and they think, you know, if I was in charge, this is what I would do. And then you look at these big brands, something big happens, and it takes four or five days to respond. That's not a luxury we have now on a campaign or social media. So what we realize is that while we all want to talk about big data and all the pieces that come with it, the reality is while we may be in an era of big data, it's also small content. You have to get things out quickly. And the idea of getting it perfect is actually less than getting it out there to have a response. Because once the frame occurs, it's almost too late to push back. And so this is what a lot of campaigns are dealing with. What the other challenge is, and I think we've seen this with Cambridge Analytica, is we've almost overcorrected where we think data solves all. And that the reality is that the pendulum has kind of overdone it, so we think that we need to know everything about you. The problem is we may know a lot about you as a voter, but that doesn't mean we have anything to say. And if you have nothing to say, you can't take advantage of it. So when you look at Unskippable Labs, which is Google's in-house creative firm, they will actually tell you that targeting is only 20% of the equation. 80% is still the content and the creativity. 
activity. And so if you can't solve for that, and you only focus on the data and this belief, somehow we believe that digital advertising can change everyone's mind. It has this, like, this, this amazing belief. If we believe that, everyone here would be drinking Coca-Cola all day, every day. Right? Like, that's the only thing you would be doing because of the amount of targeting you could do in the messaging. It's not that they can't find you. It still has to have something to say, and it has to have a message that kind of can crack through. The other biggest single change, if you think about how campaigns and how social media has changed elections, is that actually the most weaponized part of a campaign now is research. Research and digital, that you can see the territory before you get to television. And so it's almost think of it as death by a thousand cuts. So many campaigns historically wrote budgets where they took their budget, they figured out what five weeks of television was and worked it back, and then figured out what else they could do. That entire paradigm has shifted. You're going to see campaigns, the reason they're starting so early is you want to set the narrative early. And so you're starting to see the research shop create all these little hooks that you can get, and social media start to push them. And so now what we're learning is a link is a link. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be on the New York Times. There just has to be out there, and people start to move it around. And so this is changing the whole way you approach campaigns, because campaigns get stronger over time. They get better muscle memory organizational structure, but oftentimes they're not ready to be attacked early. And so this is going to totally change how people approach campaigns because the amount of research that organizations are doing and the way that they're being targeted. And the other challenge is unleashing the potential of your budget. We saw this in 2016. I mean, for example, how much people spend on television and yet the inability to move people's numbers as they went through. It's not that television isn't a huge value, it's at what value? I used the Right to Rise campaign in New Hampshire, for example. They were buying broadcast in, in Boston to reach primary voters in New Hampshire. For every $1.6 million they spent on broadcast in Boston, they were reading, reaching 3.2% of New Hampshire primary voters in the Republican primary. So that meant that while the Right to Rise spent $1.6 million, the Ted Cruz campaign could spend $45,000 on Facebook and counter that if you believe it's a one-to-one. -one. Even if you believe that television is four times more powerful than digital, which is totally fine, for $160,000 they were able to offset the $1.6 million. It's totally changed how campaigns raise their money, and the problem is most of the campaigns that have gotten very good at raising it still aren't very good at spending it, and so because they, they're just not structured that way. The other challenge that we're finding, too, is that people aren't realizing on social media people are consuming differently. In a television spot, there's kind of the opening, it builds to an arc, then you tell a final story, and you end with your brand. That whole model has broken. What we're finding online now, if you have a 30-second ad on digital, people will drop off after six seconds. They're not even giving you the chance to get to that point. We are seeing more completions of 15-second ads than 30. I, I wouldn't even run a 30-second ad on a mobile device anymore. And so what that means is you rethink the storytelling. Now you start high, you come down, you have unexpected pivot, and then you end with the part that has learned more. You give people the choice to self-select to find out more, but it totally changes because campaigns were always predicated on, like, if I get them to this 20-second mark, they'll tell me something new. Unfortunately, if your audience is gone, it doesn't matter how great that final pivot was. And yet campaigns still tell themselves. I mean, if you look through the 2016 campaign, could you tell the difference between any of the governor's spots? They all cut taxes. They were all the best for their state. Like, you could change any of their faces and you wouldn't know the difference, and yet they wouldn't understand that. So that's a huge part of it as we look through. The final thing to really think about is also, we talk about this a lot, the future is 9 by 16, not 16 by 9. So what do I mean by that? This is a television screen. But the future is your mobile phone, looking top to bottom. What does that look like? We actually, in our firm, have stopped creating any, any creative that's not mobile first. We only make one to 14 second spots, and all of our creative is on that. And it sounds crazy, but as we see more and more, the movement, the second someone gets this type of experience on their mobile device, they're starting to pop out. And so if you want to actually have people participate, I mean, there's 100 million hours of viewed on mobile on Facebook every day. I mean, the volume is there. And so you have to be able to acknowledge that, well, you may not like it or you may not think it's right, that is how people are consuming. And if you don't go to how consumers are actually consuming the information, they will block you out. It doesn't matter how great your message is. If you're not in there, you're missing out. The other thing that's compounding this is that what we have is this whole off the grid movement where people aren't watching live television anymore. People don't know, for a lot of generation, I mean one in, four, one in three likely voters didn't watch live television last week other than sports. So they don't think of Modern Family as 8 p.m. on a Wednesday. They think about it when they want to watch it. They don't think of Modern Family as a 30-minute show. They think of it as a 22-minute show because they DVR it and they fast forward through the commercials. But if you can't understand how, the com how people's consumption is changing, it's impossible to understand how actually to activate them. But what does this all mean? 
And how do you think about the future? The thing is about it, and what hasn't changed though, is when people are always wondering what's the next thing, like what's the next Snapchat? How are we gonna change how we talk to young people? The reality is the fundamentals haven't changed. We get caught up in kind of all the motion, but there's no movement. There are still truths. You still have to be authentic. You still have to have a message. The question the campaign should be asking themselves is not what's gonna be different tomorrow, but what will be the same in 10 years? What do people want to hear? And then think about how do I leverage this medium to be successful on that? Because too often we're so caught up in chasing our tails to say, this is the latest and greatest, this is the shiniest object humanly possible, and losing sight of the fact that what campaigns are really trying to do at the end of the day is still win. And the way that they can win is to get their message out to more people in a way that people can respond to. Not every race is 50-50, but when you get to a point where it really comes down to it, campaigns should be about getting someone over the finishing line and making sure they have the greatest chance for success. And I think one of the things we've lost, we've kind of lost our mind in the social media age, both of how we're consuming information, but also how we think it's actually being implemented against us. And the reality is campaigns haven't changed that much, but the structure of how to be successful has fundamentally changed. So I hope that was helpful for people just for a kind of a construct of how we look at campaigns, and I look forward to any questions at the end. Hello. All right. Well, first of all, I want to thank the Baker Institute for hosting this event and for inviting me to be on this panel. I'm very honored to be sitting alongside my fellow panelists. The only qualification I really have is the fact that I am a millennial and that I'm 20 years old and that I know social media. So today I'm going to be presenting on the millennials' perspective of social media and especially political activism and social activism on social media and how we deal with this. Um, the majority of what I'm going to say is from personal experience and talking with friends and colleagues here at Rice and from my high school and what they've experienced um, on social media. And I entitled this presentation today, The Power of the Post, because as my fellow panelists have mentioned previously, social media is the wave of the future and especially how millennials get their information. So there is a very strong constructive and destructive power of social media that needs to be addressed. Now, first I'm gonna start with what is the millennial generation? And the millennial generation, if I can get this to work. Which button did you push? Right. Well, the millennial generation has an attention span of six seconds, and including me, because I cannot figure out how to do this. There we go, all right. So the millennial generation has the attention span of six seconds, which is less than a goldfish, which is really sad. Which means when an ad is 15 seconds, we may be tuned in for half of that. He's very, very right when he says that. So the millennial generation, we have the attention span of either six seconds on Snapchat or 140 characters on Twitter. We, pr we prefer everything to be distilled into video format, especially videos with cute animals. And we're easily distracted. Not only are we distracted, but we're self-absorbed, entitled, and privileged. We conform, looking for people like us, who think like we do, live like we do, and share like we do. I know this sounds bad, and I wish it wasn't true, but unfortunately it is. And the millennial generation, although we're not very active politically right now, we are the future of America and the future voters, and so this is something that we need to address. Now, millennials, first and foremost, live and breathe social media. We use a lot of different social media platforms. Um, here are some graphs that I found. Facebook is by far what we use the most. Um, we do use it probably one in five minutes of every day. I know yesterday I checked Facebook three times and Snapchat four times, and that's a minimum, but no, it was not during class. I'm here to tell you that was between classes. But communication takes many different forms. You know, when you first meet someone at college or at a class, it's always a struggle to find out, do they prefer communicating over text message? Do they prefer communicating over Snapchat, Facebook Messenger, even Instagram direct messaging? Maybe all four, maybe none of the above. But we use social media like it's our, an extension of our being. Um, the majority of Facebook, Snapchat, and Instagram users visit these platforms on a daily basis or even several times a day. As you can see, Facebook is over 51% um, use, 51% of people use Facebook more than half of the, half, wow. Half of individuals use Facebook more than several times a day, which is saying a lot. So what does this mean for social activism and, pol and political engagement? 
Social media is our new town square. Social media is where people gather to find information, share their thoughts, and communicate with others. Yet the question then arises, are we using it for persuasion or for promotion of our political beliefs? Now, initially those sound very similar, yet persuasion is when you engage someone in a conversation and try to make them see the, the use and the value of your political belief, whereas promotion of your, your personal beliefs is just posting it and leaving it. And unfortunately, that is a lot of what millennials do. There's a fine line, and when the line is crossed from persuasion to promotion of political beliefs, social media changes from a constructive to a destructive place in the political realm. Now, I'm in, as my introduction said, I'm in a politics, law, and social thought class at the moment, and we're reading Aristotle. And so I thought, well, I will structure my presentation today on the power of persuasion in social media around the three, three Aristotelian modes of persuasion. We're at rice, right? So I have to do this. So the first one I'm going to be talking about is pathos. Now, pathos is the strongest mode of persuasion on social media. You go to social media to be inspired, engaged, or even enraged, which is very dangerous. Now, Videos were mentioned several times, ads, clickbait. Oh my gosh, millennials are just so prone to clickbait. We see a cute video and we definitely watch it. We see a link that looks interesting and we click it. Yet this is the power of social media and raising awareness. Videos and personal testimony, national movements, and we see this first and foremost on Twitter, especially through hashtag campaigns. These are just some of the major ones in the past few years. Giving Tuesday, Bring Back Our Girls, Ferguson, Black Lives Matter, the Ice Bucket Challenges, hashtag Me Too. These things started and thrived on social media. Individuals gained awareness of them by seeing their friends posting, friends sharing, and the pages they liked sharing these messages and using these hashtags. And so this is also a very dangerous form of social media as well because people go on and they say, oh wow, this must be the biggest national movement at the time. And if things are being perpetuated on social media, it can, be, it can become very dangerous as I'll mention later in my presentation. Now logos, fact finding, they're positive and negative repercussions of the fact that social media is now being used as a fact finding tool. Many individuals, especially of my generation, now go to social media to keep up with the news. Unfortunately, gone are the days of physical newspapers and even news apps. It's much easier to find the news next to the funny memes posted on Twitter by our friends than going and scrolling through thousands of news articles. This causes issues, however, especially echo chambers. Fact-finding suddenly blurs with the expression of political belief and condemnation of dissenting beliefs that is much easier to do hiding behind an avatar. Although I love the algorithms that transform my Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram feeds into videos and posts that I will probably like based on my search history, this is especially dangerous in the world of politics. I have a friend at Rice who came up to me and said, I realize that everything on my Facebook feed is in agreement with my own political beliefs. So I'm going to be trying in the next month to trick Twitter, to trick Facebook, into thinking that I'm the opposite political affiliation to see if it'll start catering different things. And it did, and that's very dangerous, because if you're relying on social media to get the facts and to hear people's political beliefs, if these social media platforms are catering your newsfeed to act and think like you do, it creates echo chambers and tribalism. Heavy dependence on social media for information has led to this tribalism to the extent that logos, fact-finding, the truth, has transformed into pathos, passion, and knee-jerk reactions. Now, finally, I'll briefly address ethos um, and how individuals are trying to create credibility. This is especially particularly important to political campaigns. It's not so important for individuals who are going on Facebook. They don't care to create credibility. Rather, they just want to post their political beliefs and leave it there. Um, yet, this is very important for politicians. You know, you may remember what happened between Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush. This is a great example of something that would have been perfect for the millennial generation. It's visual, it's easy, and also is trying to create credibility. Yet individuals, when they post on social media, go there to find interesting and engaging posts and not engage in dialogue. It's a place where often you post, leave it, and then don't go back to it until you hear your friends reacting or commenting on it. And oftentimes, those comments and reactions will lead to what we now call Twitter wars or Facebook wars. And I've experienced this firsthand where individuals will go and post something that they would never say to someone's face, which is very difficult and very dangerous to civil discourse. 
So now, what is the glitch in the system? The majority of social media and activism thrives on passion, often ignoring logic and credibility. And this is a, a graph that I kind of just made on the whim, saying that the majority of social media is used for passion and engagement or in, enraging individuals to, to guide them to action. Yet, we hope that these posts will inspire action. But unfortunately, my millennial generation, we're really good at complaining and pointing out problems, but not really finding the solution. Research has uncovered that young adults use Facebook and Twitter to share content and make others aware of social issues, but there's limited follow through to do anything. And I found a few statistics about this and I'll just pull out the major uh, main points on this. There, as you can see, um, there are about 73% of millennials and individuals who will post links on social issues. And I'm gonna flip back to that table in a second. Yet, there are 70% of individuals who have not attended an organized protest or made a speech. So there's a very big disjuncture there. Whereas 70% will post something, only 30% will actually do something. And also, you can see the danger of how you're just posting your political beliefs and not really wanting to engage people in conversation. For example, 73% uh, have expressed an opinion on a social issue, yet only 52% have participated in events. Um, are participated in service projects or club meetings. So we may want to make our, our political beliefs known, but not necessarily engage others and learn what they have to say. Now, I don't want to be the typical millennial and just point out the problem and not talk about the solution. Yet briefly, I want to talk about how unfollowing, blocking, and reporting is becoming the norm. It's very detrimental to civil discourse. I asked one of my friends the other day when I was preparing for this presentation, how would you define social media? And they said, it is a place for destructive dialogue, not a place for constructive communication. It leads to echo chambers and ideological isolation. You may think that your opinion is the most well received opinion in the world and then step outside of your phone and realize no people have differing political opinions and so that's very dangerous because when someone comes to you with an alternative point of view especially on social media our knee-jerk reaction especially as millennials is to just shut it down and close it down and there's there's a difference between opinions that are right and opinions that are wrong based on trends and finally Millennials and social media is slow to affect change. Posting does not equal progress. Now, I said I wanted to talk about something a little bit uplifting since it's a little bit sad about millennials, we do, and I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, because social media can be a force for positive change and constructive change, but we have to be acutely aware of the difficulties and dangers of it. Technology is kind of like a wild beast. If we tame it, it can be used to, to help engage people in elections, to help in, educate them about issues, to spur them to vote, to register them to vote, to educate people on political campaigns where politicians stand. Yet if we fail to tame tame this beast, it can consume our civil society. It's up to millennials and social media, technological and political leaders to acknowledge and try to fix this. And how do they fix it? They fix it by focusing on liking pages or introducing arguments that may be contrary to their own and not being afraid to embrace alternative points of view. So I hope that this presentation was a little bit enlightening as to where millennials stand on social media and where we may be moving in the future. Thank you. Okay, uh, well, thank you very much for attending today. It's a great turnout, and I want to thank John Williams again for all of his work. Uh, we, we had a great time putting this together with him. It's been a lot of fun, and both because of working with John, but also because of the content. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about a project that we're working on here at the Baker Institute on uh, Twitter. Uh, and it's primarily uh, focused on the impact of Twitter on the 2016 campaign and how it was used, especially by presidential Don, President Donald Trump. Okay, now I'm having Trump. There we go. Okay. So, uh, Twitter, as was mentioned earlier by Zach in particular, Twitter doesn't reach everyone, but it reaches a very unique group of people. That is, a report, it's, it's rare to find any reporter 
or a politician or political campaign consultant or people who are very active politically who are at least uh, you know, under the age of 50 or so who aren't using Twitter. And so it has a big impact on sort of how we think about issues and what issues are covered. And Donald Trump, especially in the 2016 campaign, was aware of that in a way that the other candidates were not and was more effective in using Twitter than the other candidates. Um, It's, from a scholarly perspective, we can use the data for a variety of purposes, and today I'm going to focus in on a few of them. So uh, Donald Trump overall uh, you know, is a very popular person on, face- on Twitter. Uh, he has you know, close to 50 million followers now as president. He had fewer during the campaign, uh, but he's very popular. He's not as popular as Kim Kardashian, uh, you know, the most ar- famous Armenian-American in the world. Yeah, I mean, very much, yeah. The most ar- famous Armenian in the world. Uh, but he, for a politician, he's quite successful. So I wanted to first go over, I'm going to be talking about Twitter, and I wanted to first go over some aspects of Twitter for those of you who aren't, don't use Twitter. So when, when uh, this is a tweet that was put out by the Baker Institute recognizing that we ranked third among best university affiliated think tanks and the uh, Center for Energy Studies uh, to be the top energy center in the world. Uh, the thing to the left, uh, that's someone replied, that's a one. 30, the one that's at 32 is effectively, some, those are retweets. That means somebody sent that message out. And then 40 people hit, is a favorite. They hit a little heart, and that meant that they, uh, they liked it. Essentially, they liked it. So those are sort of the main aspects of Facebook, I mean, of Twitter. So this is just uh, something from Kim Kardashian uh, that she put out over the weekend on the, all, the sort of the March for Our Lives. Uh, this was the tweet. Uh, 227 people had responses to it. 6.5 thousand retweeted it, and 72,000 people liked it. So this is sort of on domestic policy. She also tweets sometimes on foreign policy about the Armenian genocide. Uh, that had fewer people, uh, but 230, 231 people uh, replied to it. 3.5 uh, uh, thousand people retweeted it, and 13,000 people liked it. She also, though, you know, tweets about other things other than politics, including her makeup line. Uh, and so that one got a little more. Uh, this is a tweet, uh, this is, just to sort of follow the process, this is a tweet by Eric Erickson uh, that was done earlier this week. So he tweeted, this was his tweet about Marco Rubio. And so what often happens when there's a retweet, here's Zach Moffat retweeted Eric Erickson. Uh, then that went, if you see the followers, Zach has 15.2 thousand followers. That went to all of his followers. And then they would receive it on a page like this, which is their t- Twitter timeline. Uh, this is, and so that's essentially the way all of this process works in terms of going from a tweet to a retweet or, and how people see it. Now this goes through networks, primarily people in political circles, media circles, but it then influences what we're talking about, what reporters are writing about, and what reporters are writing, and that has this broader impact that Zach, Zach mentioned in terms of reaching through the mainstream media. Uh, so today I'm going to focus in on primaries, the Dem- Republican primary and the Democratic primary, from starting from the very start of July in 2015 until uh, the ascent- effectively the end of the, uh, the primary season when we b- knew that Hillary Clinton was the nominee and that Donald Trump was the nominee with 100% certainty. And then I'll look at the general election. Um, this involved a review of 229,000 tweets that we downloaded. Twitter isn't a f- especially helpful, so it takes a lot more work than, say, would be the case if Twitter was helpful. Uh, but we were able to do it. Uh, we get the fa- so we have information on our favorites, retweets, and then we looked at Google Trends to see some of the impact of these tweets. Uh, the candidates we looked at were Donald Trump. So throughout the rest of the presentation, Donald Trump will be featured by red. Ted Cruz by green, Marco Rubio by black, Jeb Bush by pink, and then all the other, since there are so many candidates, we don't have the palette uh, that we use doesn't have that many colors and it would get confusing, but everyone else is gray. And then on the Democratic side, Bernie Sanders is Mays. Uh, You may know that as yellow, but those of us from Michigan call it Mays. And then Hillary Clinton is blue. So this is favorites, and what you can see is Donald Trump is red. And so these are, peop- these are all of the tweets that Donald Trump made uh, during the July to May period. Uh, and you, what you can see is that 
Donald Trump is above everyone else. Ted Cruz is the green, Marco Rubio is the black, but Donald Trump is in a world by himself in terms of uh, how his tweets were liked or favorited by people uh, throughout the campaign. This is just looking at the non-Donald Trump candidates. You can see the difference. Uh, you can see that one outlier way up there. I saw that. I'm like, oh, what is that? Uh, that's a pink. If you can't really see it there. It's pink. That means it's Jeb Bush. That was Jeb Bush tweeted this. This was his, Jeb Bush's big tweet uh, that actually sort of rivaled a Trump tweet. Uh, was, he did it, though, on February 16th. And if you recall, by February 20th, he was out of the race. But this was that one tweet. On the Democratic side, you didn't see as much of a difference. That is, the blue Hillary Clinton, the yellow Bernie Sanders are pretty much mixed together, so they both were relatively comparable. Uh, Sanders was a little more active, but then when it, in terms of actual impact, uh, Hillary Clinton was pretty effective in that as well. So if we go to retweets, we see the exact same phenomenon. People tend to favorite things uh, more than retweets simply because it's, it's an easier function. And that mean, when you favor it, just, just means you're sort of liking it. When you retweet it, you're sending it out to all your followers. But the same pattern is there with the retweets at just a lower level. Once again, everybody else. And with Hillary, uh, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. Now, for the general election, Donald Trump uh, was still above uh, Hillary Clinton in terms of Twitter, but his, in terms of the number of tweets and the impact of his tweets. But if, I th if you think about how Donald Trump's Twitter uh, use favored him in the campaign, I think it was much more consequential in the Republican primary than the general election. In the Republican primary, you're competing against other Republicans. You don't have the us versus them partisan polarization effect that you have in the general election. Uh, so in the general election, it was useful for him, but I think its real impact was seen during the primary process. And this is just the same thing for the retweets. Now, Google Trends allows us to look at what people are searching for when they're out there on the internet using Google, which is the most common search app. And this is, what this shows is Google Trend data on three of the sort of pejorative terms that Donald Trump developed for three of his rivals. Uh, Little Marco for Marco Rubio, Lion Ted for Ted Cruz, and Crooked Hillary for Hillary Clinton. And you can see when he starts using them, they spike. That is, people start searching for them, and that term gets to be, become more used, uh, used throughout. And when, then when Marco Rubio drops out of the campaign in March after sort of his disastrous uh, bout in Florida, Lion Ted became sort of something that uh, Donald Trump was uh, pushing. And you can see it goes for a while. Then once he captures the nomination, it pretty much goes away, except for that one spike, which has to do with a little event in July on the Quicken Loans arena floor where Ted Cruz said some things that Donald Trump didn't like. And so there's a little spike of Lion Ted, and then it goes out. But you can see once uh, the president had sort of dispatched his two rivals, then he focused on uh, Crooked Hillary, and you can see, you can just see the impact when he starts using Crooked Hillary, how much it spikes. That is, nobody searching for Crooked Hillary, the president tweets Crooked Hillary, jumps up. So I just want to sort of finish up by looking at a couple of tweets to sort of show how Donald Trump's use of Twitter, and we see this through, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of tweets. I'm just going to have a couple of examples here. So this is one uh, tweet that Donald Trump made about gun-free zones after a tragedy in Chattanooga, where a man uh, entered a Marine recruiting office and uh, slaughtered four unarmed Marines. So he used the term here, uh, gun-free zone. Get rid of, you know, get rid of gun-free zones. I'm going to contrast it with T Ted Cruz, who was talking about Kate's Law. So we can, because Google Trends, it's, it's, you have to have some a base of, against which to compare it. So what you can see is the, the, the dotted line that goes uh, up and down, uh, the vertical line, uh, Donald Trump is, that's when Trump makes his treat. Remember, Trump is red and Cruz is green. So the discussion of Kate's Law was already strong when Ted Cruz tweeted about it. And you can see there isn't much of a spike when he's tweeting about uh, Kate's Law, when it was already quite popular. And that's other things are going on in the media where people are mentioning Kate's Law. But if you look at Donald Trump, gun-free zone, nobody's talking about gun-free zones prior to uh, July 15th. All of a sudden, the president tweets gun-free zones, it spikes up. And as Zach mentioned, it's a, Donald Trump's use of Twitter is about, it's, uh, it's 24 hours, 48 hours, maybe a week, but he moves on to other topics. And that's what you saw with this. Gun-free zone was talked about for a while, and then it sort of faded away. Uh, 
This was a, another tweet that the president made regarding when all of the other candidates were going out to see the Koch brothers uh, in California. He wasn't, because he wasn't invited, uh, or I don't think he was invited. Ted Cruz was talking about Planned Parenthood at the same time. And you can see Donald Trump, uh, Ted Cruz, when he's talking about uh, Planned Parenthood, there isn't much of an, it was already a big topic of discussion, and nothing really special happened after his tweet. With Donald Trump, on the other hand, the discussion of the Koch brothers prior to August, around August 1st, when Donald Trump's tweet occurred, was relatively low. The moment Donald Trump tweets about the Koch brothers, you can see Google Trends spikes as people start looking about who are the Koch brothers, what, and they're looking for information on them for, about them on Google. And then finally, uh, this is when he brought in Crooked Hillary, or one of the crooked, first Crooked Hillary uh, uses. Uh, actually, not one of the first, but early during the Crooked Hillary era. Uh, uh, and then this is another one of De Ted Cruz, essentially during the last you know, sort of ending of his campaign, uh, going after Donald Trump, using sort of scared as a moniker. And you can see for Cruz, there wasn't much of an effect, but you can see with Donald Trump, nobody, the red, nobody's talking about Crooked Hillary. Nobody at all, or nobody's searching for it at all through March or April. All of a sudden, Donald Trump mentions Crooked Hillary in a tweet, and that day, it spikes. It sort of is dominating uh, searches uh, throughout the internet. So this is just one more example, I think, where President Trump had a unique ability that was very different from his rivals to utilize Twitter to determine what was discussed in the media cycle in, on numerous instances in a way that the other campaigns could not. They weren't nimble enough. They were all very reactive. When they tweeted about something, it was generally after it had already become a major issue. In contrast, the data that we have show that Donald Trump in many instances creates the issue about which the media talks and about people that begin searching. And that was a powerful use of, of Twitter by the president that I think was exceptionally consequential for his victory in the Republican primary. So I'll stop there. But, uh, Thank you very much. Great. Uh, um, uh, we have a nice amount of time for uh, questions and answers. Uh, I'll be placing a few. If any of you have any last minute uh, questions you'd like to present, please raise them and someone will pick them up, hopefully. Uh, uh, my first question is to Ms. Harbaugh. Uh, you talk a lot about Facebook's efforts to you know, combat fake news and things like that. But it does raise interesting definitional questions. Yeah. And my, my question is essentially twofold. <clears throat> how do you define fake news? And how do you undertake these policies that you're doing without crowding up heterodox opinion? In other words, ha will, will, your, will your system merely reinforce conventional wisdom? in the political spectrum. Yeah. No, that's, I think that's something that we, we look at a lot and we really struggle with, and it's why we don't just take content down. Um, everybody has a different definition sometimes of what's, what's, what, what's true or not, particularly when you start to get into political, political speech. And so that's why we don't want to be the arbiters of, of truth. You've probably heard us say that quite a bit. Um, it's why we work with the fact checkers and we work with a wide variety of, of fact checkers. It's not just one. Um, and so people, if they're seeing that content, they can at least see an alternative viewpoint of somebody that may have debunked cer certain stories. We did that a lot actually in Alabama. We um, saw a lot of uh, the fact checkers were writing stories about whether or not um, one of Roy Moore's accusers had actually, whether he had actually signed that yearbook. Um, and so we proactively, we probably, um, the fact checkers marked uh, um, about 200 stories that URLs on Facebook that were talking about that as false and so that, that way their unit was underneath it. But um, this is a conversation that, that, that we, keep ha we keep having of, of trying to think through what are the best ways of combating this and also what are the best ways of providing people um, alternative uh, other viewpoints because we initially had started by having a big red flag that this was disputed, um, trying to really put it in their face. Turns out that made people believe it even more made them want to even share it even more. And you have to be a bit more subtle about it. And so that's why this is always sort of a, a, something that we have to constantly be looking at and, and iterating on. Can I say one thing to that? Yeah, sure. I, I think it's what Katie just said is so important for people to understand is because people want these organizations to know the right answer, and then they try a bunch of things, and if they don't get it exactly perfect, then everyone second guesses it. And I think that's the thing that we're learning. I mean, the, the learning that putting a big red flag is actually an indicator for people to consume more is completely counterintuitive. But for anyone 
anyone to have said that they knew that. I mean, obviously it wouldn't happen, but then it's seen as a failure. And this is the problem is that we have to be kind of responsible enough to realize that we are going to have to work through understanding this because it's new not only to the consumer, but also to the, um, the person pushing the information out. And, and I think that that's what's sometimes lost is because everyone wants the answer yesterday. They want to deploy very quickly and the unintended consequences of it are, 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 are pretty significant. And so we think about this a lot and I, and I just flagged that because I do think it was such an important learning because I actually think the concept of Facebook of fail faster is so important, but you can't only enjoy failing faster when it doesn't impact you or something you care about. And this is the challenge with politics because now it's become so personalized. And people have really lost that because, as I said, you know, people have lost their minds. It's almost like they're incapable of looking at it constructively. And we're seeing this more and more. And, and I think Facebook has now become almost like the hub through which all these arguments that people are having is occurring under. And so I, I just think that that's such a key point. Yeah. Uh I myself am very disappointed with Facebook. Uh, I will occasionally post uh, links to papers I've written and get, and get two or three likes, but I post a picture of my dog with a hat on his head, mm -hmm. and it goes mad. By the way, he is an astonishingly cute I think dog. the learning from that is you need to post a picture of your dog with the paper. <laughs> and <laughs> I am, help get more reach. I am considering interviewing him for the Institute podcast. <laughs> All right, now, uh, uh, this is for Juliet. And, and other people, too, might have a better sense of the, of the data here. Uh, when we look at the various apps here, are, 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 is there a possibility that millenn mill millennials will move away? Mm. Particularly, I'm thinking of Facebook. I mean, because, you know, somebody, I've seen young people say, oh, Facebook is just so, so boomers can complain about young people. <laughs> uh, the other best definition I've heard of Facebook is the place where you discover why you really dislike somebody back in high school. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that's not false, yeah. No, but, but there's there, and I mean, is there any data on, on, on trends? Are we, are, you know, are we reaching saturation? Will we see a decline? Sure, so obviously my fellow panelists can speak more to the exact numbers, but from personal experience living in the millennial culture, the idea of Facebook is that it is going, it's kind of reached its saturation point. That is a very common idea and belief among my generation and people my age, especially here in college. Yet Facebook still plays a very vital role in the distribution of information. If we want to know like what events are going on, if we want to know news articles, if we want to know what our friends and family are saying on this issue, we either go to Facebook or Twitter. Now, just in regard to common usage, that's definitely Snapchat. I mean, Snapchat is just going through the roof. Um, I'm guilty of that, too. Um, but we still do rely on Facebook um, in a way that we don't rely on others yet. I'd say Twitter is probably the closest rival um, in regard to the distribution of information and the expression of personal beliefs. Um, but regarding um, usage and saturation point, I would say that Facebook has kind of reached a limit, personally. But is there any data on, on, on that? I think... I mean, we have, I think we have over 200 million users in the United States. I mean, there's 2 billion users all, all, over, the, all over the globe. Um, and so we certainly, we still see people are definitely using it, but, to, um, but they are using these different platforms in different ways. And I don't think this has to necessarily be a zero-sum game. We also have, you know, Instagram's also part of the, the Facebook family. You have WhatsApp, and people are using these, these apps in, in different ways, in really interesting ways in which to communicate, and particularly to, to your point as well, about it being so much more visual. Um, and those p things like um, Snapchat and Instagram really help to fit to that. And there's changes we're making to Facebook, too, around trying to make that a lot more visual, a lot more about video. I think it's also important that people realize that it's impossible for an app to be all things to all people, so people use the apps differently. So, I mean, the fact that Facebook is also Instagram, Messenger, WhatsApp, I mean, it has a kind of a holistic reach. But, you know, Trump used Twitter. If you ask the Trump, can't, like, Trump would think, I don't even think he thinks of Twitter as, like, digital. I think it's just a communications tool, and that's how he leverages it. But if you ask this campaign why he won the election, it would be Facebook. And it's because on Facebook, there's more community, that you get donations, you get activists, you get volunteers, you get information out. And so everyone has a different role to play, just like we do in, in our everyday lives. Everything online is just like offline, but it tends to be force multiplied because we've removed the friction to participate in it. And so that Facebook's real power is the size of its community and the engagements and the things that you can do. And I think that's exactly right. Like It may not be Snapchat 
generationally is to what a lot of us who use text messaging is like, a Snapchat is a version of that, it just doesn't stay around. And that was very hard for me to kind of wrap my head around, is like how should I use Snapchat if I see all my staff in the office who are young using it as a text message replacement, and they don't mind that things are in and then they pop out and they disappear, whereas like I want every photo of my kid ever humanly possibly taken and talk about it all the time. I save my snaps just to do that. So like, it, it's, I completely don't use it the right way, but I, I think it's really important to understand that these, these all play different roles in a, in a smart campaign or any corporation or anything has to understand what role they play because they're not just one output. Now, <coughs> this question for Mark and Zach, but please, everyone feel free. You know, you were talking about the effectiveness oh, of, you oh, you're talking about the effectiveness of Trump's Twitter, right? Yeah. But this is surely not purely a, a technological function. Mm -hmm. It's a particular interface between a technology and a unique individual. Uh, can, can anybody else but Donald Trump drive Twitter in the same way? Uh, I think that's a very good question, particularly in terms of the media coverage. I mean, one of the geniuses of Donald Trump was his ability to say something and just essentially decide what was going to be covered in the media over the next news cycle in a way that none of the other candidates could. So certainly none of the other candidates could master Twitter in the same way that President Trump could. Although, you know, I think he was also willing to take the risk of doing things. And so I think as Zach was mentioning, to be less structured, to not have it go through all these different filters before it happened, and that immediacy made it very successful. Uh, can it be replicated? That, I mean, that's a good question. I suspect it can at some extent, uh, but you know, I, in many ways, he is a sweet, generous candidate. Yeah, I mean, it can be replicated by anyone if you can figure out how to talk like Donald Trump or the equivalency on, I mean, it can be done. It's just a question of, can you personally do it? And I think, it's, I think risk reward is a really good way of thinking about it. I mean, he also takes the bad with the good. I mean, he puts things out there. A lot of candidates, when they go out there, you saw a couple try to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him, Marco, for about five days, try to be Donald Trump, and then pulled back because he, he said he was ashamed. You know, I don't think that Donald Trump feels like that. I mean, the, the reason that we follow Donald Trump on Twitter is that I find out my news at the exact same time Amy does and Amy is actually a world class reporter and I am a person on Twitter. Like I get information he is truly bypassing and so you hear it. I mean it's also why people I think are reading Axios in real time because they're kind of like it's almost like you get to hear you get to be a little fly on the wall in the West Ring because everything's being leaked in real time. Like there's an element of all of us wanting to see this and pulling it in. Whether that's good or bad that's a whole other conversation but why people are doing it. You follow Donald Trump on Twitter because you are finding out just as soon as everyone else. Yeah. The difference is then the, or it drives so much earned media because it tends to be so unique that then people report on it because it is news by definition. Now that he's president, it truly is news. So I, I, people lament it and they talk about it, but to understand how he uses it and the fact that it's in his voice and people argue over whether it's an Android phone or an iPhone and is it really him and he does it from 6 a.m. I mean, I think people get up at 6 a.m. to see what he tweets by 8 a.m. and then slows <laughs> down. He is conditioned to us. Attention is a muscle. He has literally trained us to be how he wants us to consume. And for people to not understand that, they'll miss the larger point of kind of like how he's leveraging his technology. Any thoughts, Katie, Julia? So one thing that I think Donald Trump has really mastered is that social media, he understands, is meant to be enraging and engaging. You know, the, the very mediocre posts that politicians are used to putting out on Facebook and Twitter just don't do it anymore. And as Dr. Jones mentioned, you know, it's, it's those, those words that everyone then searches. You know, you have to be, you know, the colloquial American and the colloquial millennial. I mean, he, has, he tweets like a millennial. He tweets more than I do, you know? And so he is Con he's conquered that idea that even though, you know, take the bad with the good, it's oftentimes the bad that gets you more response and more awareness than even the good. The only thing I would just point out, too, that I, I find interesting as well is how he's using all these different mediums of communication um, to be getting these messages out. Um, I think too much we try to silo this of, like, was it social media? Was it TV? Was it, you know, all these different things? And it really was the combination of them and how they all work together that I think will be really interesting to be looking at how that played out in 2016 and how it's being going to play out in 2018 and 2020. I think it's really important also to understand the frame. We, a lot of people, especially in the news media thought it was really interesting when Obama said he was going to do this after 12 and they created their like the White House changed the way they do video like it's the lens through which 
you see it is also really important because a lot of what Trump did is just doing what Obama did, but more personally and on steroids. And so but it was a different, like, even like the way we're talking about reporting and Facebook advertising, we were lauded by the Obama technology and data team in 2012 for doing all the things now that is now threatening democracy and going to take the world apart. There was a time when this was, and again, the world changes, we have better understanding, our comprehension, but there is also a lens through which is the scene, which I think powers a lot of his stuff because it goes back to my point that, you know, 46% of people think the news is made up as he goes, they, they, buy, they, they get frustrated by it. And so it's just important that when you see it, there used to be a time that these stories were seen through a totally different li- lens of how great it was to bypass the media through social. Yeah, uh, and a question, I mean, it could be all of you. Um, the question that could be for all of you. Um, you know, I remember, uh, is Mr. Rove in the audience? Yes. Uh, you know, I remember a time when, you know, message discipline was this, this you know, I, every time I'd open an article about a campaign, it was like message discipline, the lack thereof, or, 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 or its, its presence. But given the remarkable success of President Trump in 2016, how important is this message discipline? Because you, as you mentioned, it's, it's over in 12, 14 hours, 16 hours, we move on to another subject. How important is message discipline? I think he sort of did have it with like slogans like make America great again and things like that that were a constant through everything that he was saying. Yeah, I agree. I, it, the umbrella message is consistent. Right. I mean, I think his execution at times was a little bit different and people thought it wouldn't translate to the general, but it, it, that there is actually a, a lot of truth to that, that he was able to do that. He takes himself off message, which is you know sometimes by choice and sometimes in general, but it is interesting that they, they, they drive towards a common point and actually hold up people accountable towards a message. I mean, I still have trouble figuring out what the Hillary Clinton's message was other than saying not Donald Trump which we found gets you about 47, 48% of the vote. Like that's just not enough. And, and, and I think that's like what they're, they're learning is that like I think he articulated a case. If you ask people in the Midwest, I mean, border security, jobs are being relocated, America first. I mean, there was a message to it. And I think that you know, if, you, if you fail to see that, you miss the larger point of why he was successful because they go back and they say, this is what he's for. You know, maybe he'll break things, but I know that the, uh, the career politicians will break it because they've broken it. And, and, and I think that there's a truth to that, and it's hard to kind of see, but there is a success from that. Well, and I think he also had a bit of Teflon compared to many other candidates in that he was excused of airs that for other candidates, the media would have latched on to and never let go if it had been Rick Perry or Ted Cruz. But just because of who he was and his ability to not be bothered by it, whereas maybe another candidate might have felt distracted by it, a need to apologize apologize and need to sort of revisit it, you know, he was, he just bore on through. And so that ability, I think, also allowed him to get off message, but then not get sidetracked by it, whereas another campaign might have spent the next two weeks apologizing for something that they had, you know, offended. As someone who misspelled, had a team that misspelled an error in an app for Governor Romney, I can tell you when you're brittle, it's really tough. When you make one mistake, it's all you talk about for two weeks. <laughs> the Trump campaign was lucky if they only had one typo a day. <laughs> and they never bothered about it. And it but it completely changed your culture. If you could if you can do that, it changes how you respond. And, and Hillary Clinton was much more like the Romney campaign than the Trump campaign. And there's a, a certain element. And they also had a candidate who could never go direct to candidate camera and pull it off. Every time she did, especially you see her on Snapchat, it was cringeworthy. Like it, it, there was this thing called chilling in Iowa. It was like <laughs> uncomfortable. If you were young and you watch it, that became the meme. So there's an entire generation who's like, how is this humanly possible that someone chose to hit publish? And, and that's part of the role of a campaign is to protect the candidate. You can't put them in situations where they can't thrive because it's a dangerous thing and Trump has picked his mediums but that is one of the challenges too that his team puts him in places where he can be successful they don't put him in places long-form debate long-form conversation that's not where he thrives and so they just look for different things and there's there's a strategy to how they execute these things any thoughts on anything else Mark okay uh, unsurprisingly Katie two-thirds of my questions I should I use a mic um, what? <laughs> Mike, uh, I like to get far away from the mic so everyone has to lean forward to hear <laughs> what I have to say. This makes me the anti-Trump. Uh, two-thirds of the questions are about Facebook. Not surprisingly. Uh, not surprisingly. <laughs> uh, you went through a lot of these, these uh, measures that Facebook is currently are undertaking or has in the past undertaken uh, to improve uh, the quality of the product that people see. Uh, 
there's a lot of talk now about regulating. Yeah. Uh, uh, Facebook in particular. Uh, I assume that you don't think government regulation of Facebook is a good idea, or perhaps I'm wrong, but do you have any thoughts on this subject? Well, I'd actually, um, if you watched Mark's interview last week um, with CNN, he actually said that um, <clears throat> He's, he's open to open to regulation, and I think that that's something that we're working with different governments on of what that might look like. I mean, there's the immediate term ones of, you know, ads transparency and, and the regulation of just political ads in general, because in, at least here in the U.S., um, you know, the FEC does not require a disclaimer on online ads. Most campaigns put it on there, um, but, you know, they're looking, they're doing a hearing on June 27th to be looking at that. Um, you know, for instance, it would be really helpful to have somebody helping us to think through how do you actually define an issue ad because I think that's something that it shouldn't be just you know Facebook coming up with their definition Google coming up with their definition Twitter coming up with their definition we should have a single definition for all of us to to be looking at and so those are active conversations that we're having with governments all over the globe uh, yeah well I think it's really important too though that you know this is an existential threat theoretically to democracy if you think foreign governments are getting involved. It is not Facebook's the only organization responsible for solving this. Like there's a national security element to this. There's like, the, if you want to give Facebook the ability to subpoena and to pull, like it's just amazing to me how we've kind of abdicated all responsibility as if it's a platform's responsibility to go solve these problems, especially when we've known that these were happening in other countries since 2014. Like I, I get frustrated because I think it's like an overcorrection and I get why from a communications perspective, but there's going to be a much more active role of government beyond regulating companies companies if we are going to across all platforms and across all technology push back on this because there needs to be some standardization and I think that's lacking right now while we're kind of in the hysterical moment of figuring out this this element. I, I don't know that we would be like this if, if a different election result would come out or the role of the Russians. So it's just something I, I flag that because I, I do think that's also very easy to put on Facebook but um, I think that's one of the challenges we have to deal with. Any other thoughts on this? Any other thoughts? On regulation? Well, I would also just point out, I think that sometimes we, it's a little overblown, this idea of Russian interference, that there was maybe Russian involvement, but we involve ourselves in elections throughout the globe as well in different ways. And it's just part of, you know, it's the natural take of foreign policy. And whether it was consequential enough, I think is questionable. Well, that's yeah. one of the fascinating questions, like, that, that a lot of this is bringing up, that I think all of us, it's not just us at Facebook, like, broader, I talk to a lot of, whether it's think tanks, academics, different universities, we've been doing a lot of these sorts of discussions because thinking about, you know, when you think about just foreign interference, not all foreign activity in another election is necessarily considered bad. You have the BBC that will cover the U.S. election. Would you say, you know, you had people in the U.K. talking about our election, we were talking about Brexit. That seems okay, but then you, you replace one of those countries with Macedonia or Russia or China, and everybody freaks out. And so where do you draw those lines? How do you think about that? How do you think about domestic actors and doing some of the similar things and, and also that sort of discourse? And what does that mean for free speech? It's just, these are this, this is why I really love my job, because these are just questions that we haven't found the answers to yet, and we're sort of setting the, setting the course for how communication and, and political discourse is going to be happening for, you know, decades. No, I mean, that's a good point. Uh, last year at the Baker Institute, we had a group of a Cuban delegation here, and one of the things they were complaining about was U.S. interference in Cuban public affairs through uh, essentially Radio Marti, TV Marti, uh, the distribution of uh, computers and other technology, effectively trying to undermine their government from our perspective. Uh, look, we're coming rapidly to a close here. Uh, uh, Zach, you were, you were basically uh, talking at least a bit about, you know, generals fighting the last war, right? In other words, the, the, the difficulty, and this is, not, this is not new, this has happened as new technologies emerge. Uh, television, I sure, yielded a gigantic revolution in advertising. I can remember when direct mail was a, that's how old I am, you know, <laughs> vigory and direct mail was this gigantic breakthrough. Uh, but what is the next big thing? Look forward. Look forward. What is the, let's talk about it, and, you, and I'm sure you're going to hedge, but what is the next big thing? I, I know you're going to say, well, we won't know until it happens. 
But have you any thoughts on the next? And this is for everybody. What's well, if I knew what the next big thing, thing I'd be a venture capitalist and I wouldn't be here. But <laughs> um, no, I, I think that the reality is that it's getting more personalized, it's more local, and it's more mobile. I mean, that's the reality. Like the consumption is moving to your device. Your device is powering everything. So it will be built around that. The challenge will be it's hard to actually see what's coming next because I don't know it used to be kind of the wild west where everything goes and now as regulation starts to move in and what we like and how we think about our own privacy and what does that look like, I, I think that will change. I think Americans have a different perspective on privacy than Europeans and what does it look like to be a global company. But I think that the, the reality is that, that it will be how people try to communicate with how people actually consume information. Right. And I think that is the death of the 30 second TV spot. That is not how anyone would naturally consume information. We trained ourselves to consume it that way. But as that breaks down, I mean, you have ESPN, who's kind of the bedrock of live sports, now moving to literally selling you you know, through mobile subscriptions to not have to watch it on television. I mean, that's when Disney is breaking from that tradition, you know kind of the market has spoken. And so I think that what we see is we see all these truths that are occurring, the speed at which that accelerates. And then also when that all starts to fragment, how do you then do it when you're competing for attention when everyone wants attention? And like the question is, is the, we're in the era of unbundling, but will the future actually bundle everything back up and pull things back together? And again, what's old is new. It's, it's just through a different format. And I think that's what we're trying to grapple with is like, where do we get our news? How do we get it. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny, we, you know, the piece that, you, the, what you mentioned about and self-selecting in your news feeds, but actually studies have shown that people's news feeds are still more unbiased than their national consumption of the publications that they read. Like, it, it shows you who you are, but there's also a reality that, that they found that social media actually does bring more into your feed than how you live. It's just that you don't have this like one concrete thing that you look at because really Facebook is kind of like the homepage of the internet. Mm -hmm. And so it, it becomes like its own internet. And so it's just important to think that, but we think about how we live, like th there's a lot of the publications we read offline, it, it's the same bias. It's just we don't feel quite as strongly about it. Yeah. Any other thoughts down the line on this? You know, I, when I think about what's coming next, to me, it's actually kind of frightening because you talk about the six second and we have a six second attention span as millennials. And I don't know if y'all watched the Olympics, but there was that five second Toyota spot that kept popping up after every single race. And it completely disoriented my mother, but I that's the only ad I remember. And what type of information do you get through in five seconds? That's dangerous. But it's also what information do you get through on a headline? Um, because a lot lot of issues that everyone, especially if you're in the public light, um, everyone is facing is that they get in, people get information from the headline. They don't always click on the article to read the article. So if the headline is misleading, that's an issue. And if the headline doesn't uh, tell you the whole story, that's also an issue. And so the future for me is like this incredible distillation of information to the bare bones, which can be very deceptive. Can, can I get a more optimistic view of it, though? <laughs> it, it, yes, it's, it's five seconds, but I think if you, if you got Mr. Rover or someone else, like, you can give your message in five seconds. It doesn't have to be. Like, it's, it's easy to assume the worst of it, but if we just, reality of like, how people consume, like, I also think that that's, what's old, what's, what's true still, right? People want message, they want to be able, you just have less time to fight for it. You don't get the luxury of 30 seconds and to build a narrative to get there, so you have to start right off the bat, and I actually think the best operatives and best campaigns will solve for this by acknowledging the way the world really works, not the way they want it to work, and then re reacting accordingly. And so like I actually am more optimistic We've had a six second section span, like when you go back, maybe it was eight before, like it, it's not like it hasn't changed huge amounts. It's, we just didn't know it because we weren't being trained that way. Millennials are just on the forefront because they don't watch the TV spots the same way. They, their, their muscle memory is just being trained differently. I don't think we as humans are that different. Uh, two really quick things. I think one, um, it's going to be very interesting to see. I mean, you saw this with Parkland, but as um, young people such as yourself and others are starting to graduate from school and starting to be involved in politics, their involvement in politics is, looks very different than just going out and voting. Um, and I think that's something that people are kind of slow to coming around to of how people want to be engaged. On, on the other side, too, of things that like particularly we're looking at as well is when you think about things like false news, you're starting to also get into a thing where like audio and video can start to be changed and make it look like somebody said something even though they didn't. And so how do we try to get ahead of that and be thinking about that? Because that's going to be even harder to combat than people just sharing URLs. 
Mark, any, any brief thoughts on the big issue? I think I'll stop at that one. Can, well, can then I, I would like well, one what, last thing. One yeah. thing for everyone to think about, though, because we're talking about these micro things. You also, there are micro trends within these macro things that are going on. Mark Penn actually has a very interesting book that's just come out, Micro Trends Squared, that talks about the very fact that people now are, used to get married right out of high school, and now they're getting married in their 30s. What that's done is it's pushed people's lives back 10 years, and we still don't know what that means. And it has impacts on how often you go to church, because you go to religion once you have a child, so now people are going 10 years later. It has an impact of how you consume your information. Like the, the life cycle is being pushed back. So while younger people are going to also get involved more, history is a pretty good indicator that also they become more Republican conservative over time. Like it, it's, there's macro trends going on with how people are living their lives that actually are far more impactful than what we're doing just with the social. So when you look at it as right now, it's because you see it as a snapshot, but if you play it out 10 years, the whole shift of how people are choosing to live their lives in cities, getting married later, has a, I think a much more impactful thing on this than anything else. Well, look, I would like to thank all of my panelists for what I think was a wonderful session. Thank you. And I believe I believe we have a coffee break. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys.